If you are a real estate agent and you are tired of cold calling, door knocking, paying for ads that flat out don't work, or just tired of not knowing how to generate leads, then this is the channel for you. We are four rockstar agents who have come together to help fellow agents achieve financial freedom as well as location and time freedom. My name is Andy Hollis along with my partners Aileen Fountain, David Doran, and Tim Hollanden. Together we have over 50 plus years experience and knowledge in the real estate and sales and training industry and we are hoping to pass that knowledge on to you. So let's get started. I am going to try to share my screen here. Hi, everybody. Um, thanks for being here. I'm nervous in front of all you all. I was an elementary school teacher, and I do love teaching, but teaching adults is very different. Um, and I did build up from nothing. So I moved to Nashville with $26 and then slowly, like, slowly grew, but then quickly grew, too. So, um, you know, I... And I'm very, very active in production. I was showing a $3.3 million house the other day, and I have a buyer who um, is qualified for 210 that I met with four years ago when she was pulled from a really bad situation. And she's been, she's going to go straight from a transitional home with her three kids um, into homeownership, which is amazing. So, like, I am very, like, all over the place. Um, but I think my niche is just, you know, helping, helping women grow wealth. Um, but I really, I love my buyers and obviously I love my listings too. So this is going to be all about the buyers. It's going to start out a little bit um, from the basics. So if you're brand new, you're going to, you're going to grasp a ton. And if you're a veteran, I have some mic drop things that I've learned in the last trainings. I've been to probably 12 or 13 trainings on NAR. I am not an attorney and I am not an expert by any means, but I will share all of the nuggets that I've gained from all those trainings to help hopefully help you, you know, not have to sit through hours and hours and hours for just like a few nuggets here and there. All right. So um, you guys already know who I am. So we're just going to go straight into this. Um, and as we're working, as we're thinking about buyers, think about what they need. Um, and I'll, I'll, like I said, I haven't taught this before and I just put this together. I had a really crazy, this has been a really rough week in real estate for me. Um, but very great week too, I guess. I have 14 listings right now and they're stressing me out because I have 14 listings and I feel like they're not selling, but it's just been one of those weeks. So we're just going with it. Um, and I will improve this presentation as I go, because I have a feeling I might be using this some more, um, especially in, you know, the girls with grit and things like that, that I'm involved with. So, um, what our clients need, they need market knowledge. So just be the expert guys, your, your clients, when they hire you, they think that all realtors know the same thing often. So if you really truly do have the knowledge, you're going to grow because they come to the person that talks about real estate. They come to the person who has answers when they ask, you know, how is the market? Things like that. You guys know all this, but really have the knowledge. And I'm going to teach you some ways to get that. Um, you guys do have access to listings. Obviously, your clients have access to listings, but I'm going to teach you some other ways that you can grab even more um, listings um, or just, you know, homes that are on the market. They're not necessarily listings. Um, the negotiation expertise is the piece I'm going to talk about the most today. Um, and obviously, our clients need professional transaction management. Uh, some people say that I'm a deadline Nazi. It's really my transaction coordinator that does that. But I do get flawless file awards and I get those because of my transaction coordinator. But my clients don't know that. They just see that I'm doing my job as far as the transactional piece goes. And I do share those. So if you guys get those um, flawless files, I don't know if every state does those, but Tennessee does. And those are worth sharing because it's showing that not only are you good at, you know, are you good at the real estate piece, but you're also meeting your deadlines and getting your files in on time, which is actually what your clients want, even if you don't realize that that's what they want. Um, they're looking for us for objective advice, of course, and we're here to save them time and energy, mental energy, um, all of those things. And then we also can lead them into ways to, um, to have less risk. So with our uh, title attorneys, our inspectors, things like that. So just remember that you are, they're trusting you with their biggest purchase. So 
When we talk about market knowledge, you want to educate yourself, but you also want to educate others. So one of the things that I like to do is not keep everything to myself. If I learn something, I want to share it. And I think all of us need to do that. So that's what I'm doing here today. As far as trainings go, attend. Regardless of, of the topic, try to attend at least one training a week. You guys can all dedicate one hour, especially with the Zooms, to one training a week. If it's this one, I think that's fantastic. If it's an in-person one, that's fantastic because then you're meeting other people. Um, teach, when you, when you teach, you learn. So there's actual a lot, there's a ton of research on this. Older kids, they tend to excel more. Um, they have higher IQs, um, older kids and families. And one of the reasons that they're finding that that is, is because they've taught the little ones. So when you teach, you actually learn. So if you have an opportunity to go out and teach, teach your clients, if you learn something in a training, pop on, um, you know, social media and do a little live and say, I just learned this, you know, just share it. Who cares if you don't even really have an audience picked out? Because when you're teaching something, you've actually learned it and you become a master of it. And then share, that's kind of the same thing. Just share what you've learned. Um, and you gain credibility. I just attended this, you know, local, you know, community meeting. And did you know that this is what's going in by the park or we're spending this much on the park? Whatever it is, just become that expert. But you do that by becoming, by going online and um, sharing that knowledge. Local trends. You need to know your local trends. It's not so much about sharing, um, to me anyway, it's not so much about sharing exactly what's happening in the real estate market. I do some posts about, you know, home values are up this much or down this much, but for you yourself, you want to know those numbers for your buyers um, and for your sellers. So you um, learn and use your local MLS trends, whatever um, your MLS provides that shows what's happening in neighborhoods and learn how to hone in for your buyers if they're looking at certain types of properties, things like that. Um, and then use RPR. If you guys aren't using RPR, you need to take some classes on that and really truly get, get to know it. I'm sending out for the first time this week, <clears throat> excuse me, I am sending out postcards for an open house and I'm going to be using the RPR because I think we get like 5,000 labels a month for free. And they're already, it's all the people that live in an area and the addresses are already there and you just print the labels and then you mail out the postcards or whatever. So even me, I'm still like taking all these classes and learning the trainings on, on RPR. And I have just an example here. Hopefully it'll go straight over. And it did. So I just pulled up a house that I am going to be listing in an area next week. But RPR has, you know, the market trends here. It shows the months of inventory. And all I had to do to get this was put in the, the address. Um, so you go in with this knowledge or you just look at your own neighborhood or, you know, if you're going to be around people at a party or something and you know that people are going to be asking, just take a quick glance at this so that you have some a topic to talk about. What is the median list price? You know, how is it looking? How many months of inventory? And things like that. So I just wanted to share that with you. It's super easy. We, I believe we all have access to RPR. Um, and do you know the price per square foot in your neighborhoods? Um, are you watching the property values? All of those things. What are your neighbor, neighborhood dynamics? What is different in your neighborhood? You know, does every house have a garage or is a garage something that's super unique? In my neighborhood, there's no parking. Everybody parks on the street. So if you have a driveway, that's worth you know, probably $20,000 extra. So, um, you know, you need to know the dynamics of different neighborhoods and the neighborhoods that you're working for your buyers so that you can negotiate better. And you can, whenever you're putting in an offer for a house, you can let your um, buyers know, like, you know, this price might seem a little bit high, but in my opinion, you know, or the research is showing that driveways are worth X or that extra half bath is worth X. Um, RPR also allows you to... Um, see what an extra bathroom would bring you in value in a neighborhood. So that tool is also very helpful because, you know, your buyers might say, oh, I wish I had, a, you know, two bedroom or two bathrooms. And you could say, okay, well, you know, this con this contractor over here can do a bathroom for X amount based on what my other clients paid. 
And according to RPR, uh, extra bathroom in this neighborhood is worth X amount. Um, so that's just a fantastic tool. Um, sorry, we've got a water machine in here, if you can hear that. <laughs> um, and then can you negotiate? Okay, I just talked about that. Also, attending your zoning meetings, zoning meetings are awful. They're boring and they're awful. But if you attend those, you're going to meet the developers. You're going to know things even before the news knows them. So if you like to have the information and be involved in the community, zoning meetings and community meetings are a great place for you to go um, to learn about those. Um, I promise we're getting to some really good stuff here. So I'm going to kind of go through this pretty quickly. Um, access to listings, same thing. Get to know other agents and builders. I bet if I went through my deals, especially during um, all of the multiple offer situations, almost all of them came, I got them because I knew the other agent. So get to know those other agents. Go to the coffees, go to the networking, get them on this call. Um, you will also build your um, your reputation and possibly your downline from that. So I've never recruited an agent, but I have 39 in my downline because I know agents and I just want to work with them. Um, but when you know other agents, you do find out what's coming on the market. And you can also, when you share stuff out there of your listings, they see it and they respond and they share with their, with their peers or with their um, buyers as well. So, and as a buyer, you certainly need to get to know the agents. So sometimes if I have a buyer for a certain neighborhood, I will look and see who sold all of the recent, you know, the, the agents that sold recently in that neighborhood. And I call them and say, do you have anything else coming? You know, just trying to get all of the knowledge. So call other agents and ask, use the MLS and look at those sold listings and get as much information as you can. Um, builders are the same, obviously. Um, and when you have buyers, I think working with builders is obviously is easier with buyers. I have sold for some builders before, but I feel like for the builders that I've sold for, they switch listing agents often. So I don't know if that's everybody's experience, but they still, we still have that relationship because they know that I also have buyers that I can bring in. Um, also with buyers, guys and builders, I didn't put this on here, but ask for things ask for things with, even with your nationwide builders, ask for the washer dryer, ask for the fence, ask for the refrigerator, um, you know, ask for the incentive. Sometimes they won't come off that price, but they'll do a two, one buy down or they'll do the fence. I've had two builders in the last 12 months say, the agent told me they, my builder has never done a fence and they did a fence for me. So ask for those things. That's representing your buyer. That's doing your job for the buyer. Um, so also, go to platforms where you can search for homes that aren't on the MLS. Look at ZenList. Um, although ZenList should be on the MLS, but you know, for we have access to ZenList and we don't have access to every MLS. So um, look for your for sale by owners on Zillow if you're looking in a certain neighborhood or just for fun. Um, you know, if you have a down moment, look on there. You might get a listing out of it, but you're also shopping for your buyers, and you might be able to bring them something that other agents aren't doing. And when you're doing your um, buyer presentations. So we need to be having buyer presentations like we have listing presentations. So you need to be meeting your buyer, setting the expectations, getting the buyer rep signed. And during that, you're, you're saying these things you're doing. I'm looking at Zillow by owner. Can your buyer do that? Yes, they can, but they might not have time. But other agents aren't telling them that. Look at your Facebook marketplace. Um, Pinterest has um, homes now. So look at all of those different places and share what you're doing with your buyers. Also, um, you can start Facebook groups um, for your area. We've got one of my agents started a, I don't know, Illinois to, to Tennessee Facebook group. Like a lot of these um, groups don't exist. So if you are seeing that people are moving to your area, and I've heard that the Chamber of Commerce can tell you where people are moving from. So that might be another thing that you could do for your buyers is go in and find out, you know, where are people moving from and, you know, start a Facebook group or some kind of group for those people. And again, become the expert in that. 
um, and share your knowledge, share it freely. Here's my buyer guide. Here's this, here's my favorites, you know, all of those things. Um, you guys can use Google Gemini and chat GPT to create, um, guidebooks for different areas of your city in literally like two or three minutes. And, um, I believe Google Gemini will even put pictures in there. So you guys can, you know, create blog posts or guidebooks and share those, you know, for free. Um, and then share where you were, you know, I was at the community meeting and, and, you know, there's a new neighborhood coming or who wants to know what's happening on the corner of fifth and maple, things like that, P things that people will, will get people excited, but also are like, you know, kind of subtly saying, I know what's going on in the neighborhood. I'm the expert here. Um, and then I put, um, actions on the sides that you guys can just, cause I know when I go to trainings, I'm like, what can I do today from that? that I learned in that training. So if you aren't doing these things or want to do them, there's um, action items on the side of each slide for you. All right, here's the, um, probably where we're gonna spend the most time today is the negotiation piece. And that is um, the biggest piece that you wanna share with your buyers in your um, meetings with your buyers, your reputation, all of the things you, you want to be known as a master negotiator. And I'm gonna give you a tool that I think will really help with that. Um, so here's the spreadsheet I'm talking about. And it looks so simple, but I think it's pretty powerful. So this one, just pull it over. The address doesn't really matter. The days on market kind of matters because if you are getting um, listings that are zero, one, two days on market, you're showing your future buyers that you're quick. You're showing your future buyers that you're grabbing houses before anybody else saw them. You're showing them that you're committed to getting them in the house first. So, um, on my sheet, I'm putting my list price down and then I'm putting my contract price. Okay, and I didn't skip any here. I've not gone through all of them. This is just starting with the first of the year. I'm not skipping any. If you want to skip, I mean, data can be, you know, manipulated. So if you have one that was not beautiful and you wanna skip it, that's up to you. I'm putting all of mine out here that that I represented the, the buyers on. Um, So here's my, um list price and my contract price. So on this one, you can see we even went a little bit over, um, but this one was in multiples. So, but then if you looked at the appraised value, we were still under the appraised value here. Okay. This one had been on the market for a long time. It was a condo. As you guys know, condos are, have been hit pretty hard this year. So it was a cash deal. They waived the appraisal. Um, this one, they had a hundred thousand dollar price drop, but we, um, it was listed. They did have a price drop here. We got it under contract for nine fifty, but it's still appraised for nine sixty. So if you look four out of my first five appraised for more than what they paid, um, which was fantastic for this year, I think, um, my concessions here, those were all, um, Seller paid closing cost. All of those were. And then here, I'm sure most of you guys know this, but make sure um, with title insurance that you're getting that reissue credit. Okay. I, every single time, even regardless of which side is paying for title, I always ask for that, um, for the old title policy. And some of you guys, I'm going to slow down just in case you don't know what I'm talking about. So, and I, I assume every state's the same and please, um, Sean or Kathy or Jeff, if I'm wrong, please let me know. But title insurance is good. If a title policy is less than 10 years old, at least in the state of Tennessee, and you can produce the old title policy that's less than 10 years old, then the new buyer gets a discount on the new policy. And it's usually about 30%. Also, my the title company I use the most often, if they do both sides of a deal, they do it for half price. 
So not the title insurance, but their actual fee, which is usually 595. So it brings it down to 295. Also, it's only, I mean, it's only $295, but it's also $295. And it's a service that I can provide to my buyers. So when you go in to a buyer appointment and you're saying, if we find you a house that's less than 10 years old, I am going to request in the contract their old title policy. That might save you a couple thousand dollars. You're saying something that no other agent is saying. And in these buyer appointments, that's what you want to do. So as you can see here, I was able to do this on, um, you know, on four of the first five deals. If you're negotiating a home warranty, that also is, that's a negotiation point. That's a, that's working in favor of your buyer. So I put those on there. Here's my extras. So I don't always write refrigerator in, but it, it appears that I do. But yeah, so we got this one. Um, Holy Ave had, um, it was a ranch with a basement suite downstairs. So it had two new refrigerators. And this one had washer dryer. So those are extras. So I just approximated the value there. Okay. Any escrow repairs. I'm not advocating for after closing escrow money, but if you do negotiate for that, I have one right now that's got $42,000 after closing. That's going straight to the contractor. It's a separate escrow agreement, but I negotiated that. So I think it's worth putting the escrow repairs in there if you do those. All right. So then I take the number over here, whether it was the, uh, if the appraised value is higher, then I take that appraised value, I take the contract price and the appraised value. So here the contract price is 606,000, but the appraised value was 615. So it's $9,000. Um, so then I, Maybe I said 11 here accidentally because I like whatever they call it, dyslexic with numbers. But anyway, you guys see what I'm what the point is here. So you take the appraised value. There's $9,000 right there between the contract price and the appraised value. So your buyer's already walking away with $9,000 in equity. Okay. And the concessions and the title savings and the home warranty and the refrigerators and if I did it right, it was 24,000, it might be 22, right? But I negotiated 4% here, all right? On top of that, they did about $12,000 in repairs. Those aren't even included. I'm just talking about this negotiated percentage right here. So when I go to my buyers and I'm in a buyer appointment and I'm telling them, this is what I say, sort of. I mean, we've not had to do this a whole lot yet, but I say, Every single deal that I have historically done, I've been able to negotiate my commission. Every deal. In the future, I might not be able to do that. I'm going to call that seller and I'm going to ask if the if their seller is paying for your representation, which is me. And I'm not calling it a commission. I'm trying to say compensation or fee, okay? And I'm telling them, this is what how it's going to go. I'm going to call Jeff and I'm going to say, hey, I want to show your property on 123 Maple Street. Are you paying a buyer broker commission? And he said, well, my seller chose not to do that. And I say, okay, um, will you ask your seller with a reasonable offer if he will offer buyer broker commission? And if Jeff says no, I say, will you please call them and ask them because you can't answer for them unless it's already in writing. Okay, that right there, that puts you... That's showing your, you know, that you know what you're talking about. And you can't be afraid to have those conversations. If you're a woman, sometimes you have to say, please talk to me like I'm a man. And it's unfortunate, but it's true. And then you have respect. Okay. So that causes everybody to step back for a minute and respect you. Okay. So then they call, let's say, so I'm telling my buyer this, right? And I say, if the agent calls back and says, nope, they absolutely will not pay. I'm like, okay, if that's the case and I feel like I can't negotiate it, what do you want to do? Here's how much money you have. Here's my fee. Do you still want to see that property? And you let them answer. Okay. 
you can also still write it in the contract when you make the offer. Just because they said no doesn't mean you can't try. And, um, but then I say, my fee is X amount. Here is what I've done for my buyers in the past. On average, I've saved my buyers 6% of the purchase price or of the home. I don't know about any of you guys, but I would pay 3% to get a 6% return. And when you say that and you explain it, then they're realizing that your value, this is your value. Okay. Being the hardest worker in the room, that's your value. You go, you talk to your buyers and you tell them what you can bring. This is what you can bring. These are your numbers. Okay. You can say years of experience. You can say, I love you. I adore you. I'll babysit your kids, whatever. But other agents are saying those things. Are other agents saying this? Are other agents saying, I pick up the phone and I get on, on the phone with the other side and I tell them what I'm doing? So everything that you're doing for your buyers, put it out there and tell them, this is what I'm doing for you. This is what I'm doing for my other buyers. Now look at the repairs. So I've negotiated this percentage based on the value of the home. That's not even including these repairs. Look at some of these $30,000 in repairs. How are people going to do this without an agent? They can't. They cannot do this without an agent. They don't know about the title fee, the title discounts. They don't know what they can negotiate. They don't know that they can ask a new a new builder for a fence. Um, so this, I think, once I learned this, I thought it was super powerful. I don't know if, you know, Kathy, do you want to chime in? Oh, I put in there in the comments fire. I mean, this is so good if you guys haven't thought to do this. I mean, this right here, besides your list of all the things you do that you might, that you go through when you do your presentation, when you can show actual hard numbers of my, like she just said, it's 3%. I'm saving my buyers on average 6% in this current market, not even counting all these repairs. I mean, your buyer really doesn't have much to say in um, an argument for a 3% commission or whatever number you're looking to ask for. Yeah. So, I, and, I love it. It's so good. It's thank really good. You. Thanks. <clears throat> and Kathy, thank you for mentioning the list. Guys, if you posted that list of like, oh, I put gas in my car and oh, I wash my car and oh, I have to pay taxes, go delete it off of your socials, please. That list is embarrassing. As a professional, that list is embarrassing. Every Everybody has to put gas in their car. Everybody has to pay taxes. Everybody has to, you know, do 90% of what's on that list is a job description for any job. So when you guys are showing your value, don't go post on social media that you put gas in your car. Okay, that's that's not your value. Your value is what are you actually doing for your clients and getting them houses at a good price that are worth what they're paying for them. And then what are you got, what are you doing to make sure that they're getting a good home? So that's what I feel about this. Now, also in my conversation with buyers, I'm also telling them, you guys, without a buyer, there was never a transaction. Okay. And your sellers, if they aren't willing to pay a, and this is what I tell the other agents too. I'm like, okay, and this is going to really help your buyers. I haven't thought about this until just now, but when you're on the phone with that listing agent and they're saying that their seller is not willing to pay a buyer broker compensation, you can say, well, your buyers are expecting a discount because they will be like buyers that are going without an, without an agent are expecting a discount because they're not getting this level of service. So, you know, even though we're on the buyer side, we can still be, you know, kind of paving the road for the future ahead for the sellers. Um, I'm you know, one thought, one thought about this list, um, about the appraised value, I don't always get that from the lender. So is that just something that it, it remind it makes me think if I'm going to use this, every single time I need to find out from the lender when I'm representing a buyer, 
what it appraised for. You know, because a lot of the lenders will just say, you know, hey, it's appraised, we're good. And I'm trying, I'm, I'm thinking through my buyers. Like sometimes I ask, but do I always ask? I mean, I don't typically get a copy. The buyer will get a copy. So obviously you can ask them, but that also is a good reminder. Just if anyone else is like myself, I never get a copy of it. Sometimes I do ask, but I love having the difference of when it, especially when it appraises for higher than, you know, what your contract price was. Yeah. And honestly, I didn't realize until I just presented just now that four of those five were, because I'm just like, like I said, I'm just going in order and guys, this takes some time. Like, you know, I, I learned this a couple of weeks ago and I did it last night for this presentation, but you better be, believe I'm going to be using it with my, with my clients. Um, but it takes some time. You have to go back. You have to look at the MLS. You have to remember what they ask for. You have to look at, see if you had an escrow agreement. Um, I had to call some of my clients for the appraised value because I've, you know, the lenders, I think they can send it to us, but I feel like most of my appraisals came from my, my buyers just because I did ask. So, um, it does take some time to do this, but I'm, I mean, here it is. I'm, you know, I'm giving it to you. So take it, let's, let's roll with it. Um, also another thing, whenever you guys are talking to your, um, your listing agents or your listing agent yourself, and you're talking to clients about listing, let them know that real estate is, um, momentum driven. Buyers almost always buy based on the momentum. And if you're stopping that momentum because you're not paying a buyer's agent, you're going to kill some deals. So let your let your um, sellers know, and also on the phone with those listing agents, say, "Oh man, there's you know, you've you've staged this house, you've painted this house, you've done the landscaping, you've got everything going, you've got all this momentum going, and it just you're going to put a stop kill on it right with that, you know, with that buyer agency um, not paying that." So. Um, you know, use those phrases. Momentum's a big word in real estate. So when when I've got a listing appointment, I'm letting my people make that choice. But I'm saying it's a very momentum driven business, and I don't want to stop the momentum. You know, you're willing to pay for staging. You're willing to do all these things, and then you're gonna. You know, I just that's your choice, but that's a momentum stop. Um, so that's just another thing that part of the conversation that I'm having. Um. Anything else on this before I move on? Can you share, do you have a blank template with all of that that you can just share with an Excel? Is that Excel or Google Sheet? I can make, yeah, I can make one in two seconds. I don't have one, but I'm happy to send one out after. I did put all the um, steps post. right here. If you guys want to, you know, screenshot this or save it or whatever. If it's easy enough for you to um, share one, then we can post it with your presentation after. Okay. Um, yeah with yeah. the freedom team. Thank you. I'm happy to do that. Um, all right. So that was the, I mean, that was the big piece that I wanted to share with everybody, but I do have a couple of other things. Oh, and also go ahead and make yourself a resume. All right. Make yourself a buyer resume. That way when people are, you know, if they are shopping buyers or they're just talking about buying and you're trying to, you know, win them as a client, you have like an actual resume that shows your experience. You know, you can put things like I saved my average client X percent on there if you wanted to. Um, but I think also sharing the actual list is awesome if you can get that in front of them. Um, and transaction management, we talked about that. Don't miss your deadlines. Um, get those awards. Hire a TC. Um, I should have hired a TC long before I did. I think most of us that have them probably feel that way. Um, so that's been hard for me because I'm a do it myself type of person and um, I may have some trust issues, but definitely get um, a TC and assistant as soon as you can so that you guys can have the freedom to, to go network with agents and, um, you know, just be out there in the world doing things other people cannot do for you. Um, and knowing what your contract says. So really, really know what your contract says, because if you know what it says, you can use that in negotiations as well. Um, close on time. Guys, whatever it takes to close on time. I have had title agencies not answering me. I've gone and knocked on doors, um, you know, shown up in person. I have had employee verification um, not come through in time. I have gone to mechanic shops and been like, 
I need you to help your employee over here buy a house. Well, I don't have a computer here. I'm like, well, here's mine. You know, I've opened, I've opened email addresses for people, like started them on Gmail to be able to get things signed so that we can close on time. Um, just this week on the other side of a deal, I had the buyer, but they had the seller. That agent sat in codes and hand walked paper from one office to another office to get the things to close on time. So do whatever it takes to have on-time closings and, you know, just that's part, unfortunately, it's part of our job. So, you know, do your job and go above and beyond and you will continue to get clients because my clients that we just closed last week, they're still not thrilled with every, the way everything happened, but I know that they're going to recommend me to everybody they know because of the level of work that went into that deal. Um, so, you know, I do think that that's a really important piece and I do think that you share that in your buyer rep agreements. I know the people at Codes, you know, they, you know, all of those things that can help you, especially if you're doing like a new construction. So um, just be involved um, and work hard. It's not, you know, it's not brain. It's not, you know, I don't know. It is hard, but it's also not hard. Just do the things that it takes. Okay, another thing that I learned, and I thought this was really interesting, and I'm going to really stumble probably trying to explain this, so please jump in um, with this. I had yesterday, a lender was explaining that he had a deal already where he had a low appraisal. So he had a buyer paying for their own representation, but then also the appraisal came in low. And unfortunately, many times they're probably going to come down on the buyer's agent for the compensation piece to make up for the appraisal gap. And what this lender did is he took them from a 80% loan to an 83% loan to be able to cover the buyer agent fee for that agent. So he took him from an 80% loan to an 83% loan, and there was $1,800 of, of MI there, the mortgage insurance, so to keep the payment the same. So I'll say that one more time. There was a buyer who was paying their agent 3% on the buyer side. The appraisal came in low rather than using the compensation from the buyer's agent to make up for the appraisal gap, the lender suggested doing an 83% loan and there was only an $1,800 difference um, for the mortgage insurance and the payment remained the same. So, um, or, or very, very close to the same. So in that case, that buyer was willing to pay the $1,800 for that. That might be a case for me. You know, I... I'm not advocating that we should cut our compensation by any means, but that may be a case for me where I was like, okay, if I'm going to get $18,000, you know, and this is, there's an $1,800 overage right here, I might actually have to cover that personally. So, you know, I'm not suggesting that we need to do that, but I'm just saying there are solutions out there. Don't just let things eat your commission away or your compensation away. Okay, so work with lenders who are getting creative in this and who understand and who will take the time to work out different situations to be sure that you get paid. Um, on the buyers, I, I totally agree with that. You know, and what I'll say here is, you know, what I have experienced in my 25 years is a lot of agents have not really chosen to understand all the numbers of a transaction. And now it's going to be more important than ever. So, you know, they thought, oh, the lender can handle, you know, that's the lender's job, whatever. Now it's, we get to really understand all the numbers of the transaction. And that's one of the things that I've always felt is one of my strengths because there's been so many times I've been able to negotiate against the seller if I'm representing a buyer because I understand all the different ways you can manipulate the numbers. It's kind of what you're talking about, Jess, like with the lender being creative. So in addition to learn RPR, if you don't have that, 
I'm going to suggest if you don't understand all the numbers to a transaction and how they can get manipulated around, so to speak, you know, have some copies with your lenders and get them to walk you through all the cost of a transaction. Take one of your past altas, your last closing statements, all that. Study every number that your client has on there. Understand what they are because some of those numbers are negotiable in transactions, just as just mentioned with the title expense, right? She talked about getting the you know, policy for the discount, the reissue credit, but sometimes the seller will pay that, sometimes the buyer pays that. That's a negotiable number. Your lender fees, sometimes, why does sometimes a buyer pay or a buyer pay points or origination fees? And sometimes they don't. It really comes down to what the rate is that they're being quoted from the lender. But again, your lender may be quoting a rate with a 1% origination fee. And if it's a $400,000 loan, that is $4,000. Well, then the question by knowing this, the question to your lender is, what's the rate if they don't pay an origination fee? So the rate might go up an eighth of percent and it might make $50 a month in the payment difference, but guess what? You just gained $4,000 back in closing costs for your buyer by kind of understanding the numbers. And so, again, I'll just encourage you guys, if you don't really know how to manipulate the numbers, have some copies with lenders to understand them all and what what which ones are negotiable and which ones can you, you know, change around if need be. So I've done that so many times, you know, lender, lenders will have it. They don't as much now have the origination fee, but there's still some that do. And so my immediate question to them is how much is the interest rate? You're quoting an X percent rate with this origination fee. How much is the interest rate if they don't pay an origination fee? And then I'll calculate the difference in the payment um, or I'll have the lender do it, right? I mean, you've all, there's these apps out there that you can just easily calculate that. And I'll be like, okay, you're going to pay $50 more in a payment by raising the rate by this 8% buyer. But by doing that, we get $4,000 that now can go towards your closing costs, that now can go towards your buyer broker commission if the seller's not covering it, all that. So I hope that helped and didn't confuse everybody. Yeah. And another thing that I do and all of you, all of us can do is um, we can, I create a spreadsheet for my buyers for when they're shopping rates. So my lenders don't love that, but it's the best thing for our buyers to do. So, and on there, it has, you know, an origination fee if there is one, other fees. Um, I also put on there to make sure that they're um, just, um, Insurance principal and interest only payments because really the taxes and the insurance should be the same. And I've seen lenders reduce insurance to something that's not even realistic to make their payments look lower. So, and I explained to my buyers, you know, relationships with your lenders are super important too. So if it's the difference of, you know, $8 a month, then go with the lender that you felt the most comfortable with, but at least compare and know that you're getting the best you know, the best rate or the best deal out there. And I tell my buyers, you get this spreadsheet for working with me. It's something I've already put together. They don't know what to look for. They don't know what to compare. It's another reason they need an agent. Um, so that's another thing you guys can do. Um, also, please go meet with your local banks and credit unions. I'm begging you. A lot of us, we were never, ever, ever taught that there are 100% no PMI programs out there, 102% no PMI programs out there. So please, your local banks and credit unions can do things that a lot of mortgage brokers can't do, especially for your first-time buyers who are the ones that need it most. Right now in Nashville, I have one bank that's doing 100% no PMI conventional. These are conventional loans. 100% no PMI conventional and a $15,000 down payment grant local bank what can that do for your buyer that needs their that needs to you know pay for their representation of course i'm 
convinced I can get my sellers to pay, but if not, there it is. Okay. We, we will start, I am convinced that we will start seeing more of these grants. If sellers stop paying buyer's agents, we are going to see more of these grants for first time buyers. And you have to get to know where they are and who has them. And the only way to do that is to go meet with them. Well, the one thing, I don't know if you saw this, Jessica, and I don't know if every state has this, but if I, Carrie Ann, I think said THDA, which is one of these grant programs, Tennessee Housing Authority, I don't think their their grant money that a buyer gets cannot go towards compensation, I think is what she posted yesterday. So even knowing the grants that's available, you mm -hmm. need to find out on each of these as you're talking to your lenders and your credit unions and all, can this money be used towards buyer broker compensation? So that's another question that we get to ask when we're meeting with these people. And it probably can't, but it can be used towards other things, which means you can maybe offer a little bit more for the house. And you guys, it's all, like Kathy said, it's moving the numbers around. Guys, the buyers really, like in my mindset, the buyers were always the ones paying every side because without a buyer, there's no transaction. And I've never seen a settlement statement where the the agents were paid from anything but the proceeds from the sale, which come from the buyer. So they, um, you know, it's that's just all part of my conversation. But yeah, but these grant programs look for them. You know, THDA also, guys, look and see if the loans are assumable too. Okay, because for your buyers you know, teach in that class. Did you know VA loans are assumable? Did you know all FHA loans are assumable? Did you know all THDA loans are assumable? THDA in Tennessee, those loans they're doing in 28 days. They have a whole department and they're doing the THD assumable in 28 days. Not many agents know that. When you're telling your buyers these things and you're you're looking to see what kind of loans these the sellers have, that can all help your buyer. So um, especially if those Purchases were in the last two years where home values were very much the same. Um, so just get to know those, you know, we all are going to just have to get to know our career better. This is making all of us better. I know more about buyer agency in the last two months than I would have ever dreamed I would have known because of this suit. So we all are going to get better at our jobs and, and just get to know our careers better. We're going to have to, um, you know, absorb ourselves in this and learn and learn and learn. And it's going to be better for everybody. Um, your inspectors and your closing attorneys, obviously they help mitigate risk. Um, I love my inspectors because I can call them and say, how big of a deal is this? You know, or, or you know, your inspectors, obviously they work for your clients and I, I don't even realize how much I lean on them when I'm negotiating repairs now, because some things, you know, might look like a big deal or not. You guys know all this, but like I had, I had one buyer who was a doctor and she was already super nervous in the house that she liked a beam in the roof was split, like completely splintered open. You could see the light through it. And I was thinking in my head, they're going to have to take this roof off, you know? And then you get the, you get the guys in there and they're like, no, you put up a board here. You put up a board here. You nail them together and it's the strongest truss up there or whatever they're called. And like, I didn't know. So I feel like just my, you know, my worry worried her and it was like unnecessary, but that all comes with experience. Right. And then there might be something to me that doesn't look like a big deal and it is a big deal. So, you know, also, you know, using your knowledge of those inspections and the, you know, just your expertise. You are not an inspector. I can't say anything about the house. I'm not an inspector. I'm not a roofer, any of that stuff, but I can kind of know when I'm walking around a house, you know, just based on the experiences I've had with homes, if, you know, a buyer should be more nervous or not. Um, and attorneys, oh my gosh, I can't even tell you how much I lean on my title attorney. And that's another thing is I have a really, really close relationship with a couple different title attorneys. So that's just another value for my buyers is they, they have access to some legal help, um, you know, and that's just something they can't get on their own without paying for it. So that's just another, 
another little cherry on top. So I just say create relationships with both. And I think that's all I have. Oh, this was um, just some other things for buyers real quick. Uh, my favorite thing is house hacking. That's kind of how I got into real estate. Um, for your first time buyers, please teach them that they can house hack or people who are renting apartments. So um, there's, um, these pictures aren't great. This wasn't my listing, but this is something that I showed to a buyer. Um, it had like an apartment in it. So like you can, house hacking is where you get your mortgage covered basically. So you can, if you have the credit to buy an apartment or a condo and live in a camper, that's what I did with my first house hack. So I had my apartment or my condo. I rented it out on Airbnb. It was making about $8,000 a month. My payment was $7.92. I had a little camper. I was at the lake with my paddleboard, my golf cart. I was single. I was living my best life out there. I loved it. Um, but that's one form of house hacking. Um, because I had the credit to do it, I went ahead and took advantage of it. Um, having roommates, fantastic way. Um, if you've got kids in college, look into getting a, a multi-bedroom house, put your kid in it, rent those other rooms out. So like all your first time buyers, you can do these like creative things. Um, even a lot of single moms are starting to buy together, which I think is amazing. And as a mom who is not single, I cannot imagine being a single mom. And I would have to live with somebody to help with the meals and the just everything. So I still think it's better for two friends to buy together than both friends rent. Um, and here's another one. Um, this one has a pool. It was listed in Nashville. Um, short-term rentals in this area um, with pools are doing like $150,000 to $200,000 a year in Nashville. They have to be zoned a certain way or it has to be owner-occupied, but that's just another example of house hacking. Um, so that was, you know, just another little thing for your buyers. You know, if you have first time buyers, that's a great way to get them in without the stress of taking on a full mortgage by themselves. Also, um, FHA, I believe now will allow a duplex, a triplex or a quad. So I think that's a new, something that, that for a while FHA wouldn't do, but I believe they're doing that again. Ask your lender to make sure unless one of you guys know.